Hello and welcome to Northeast Animal Rights series, the latest in the series of Saturday Spotlight interviews. Today we have John Orwin, who is a voice for the voiceless, vegan nutritionist and also a published author. So welcome, John, and thank you very much for giving up your time today. Thank you very much, Anna, for um, inviting me on here. You, you're most welcome. Now, we, we talked about, we want to talk about you, your life, because you've had an extremely interesting life. So could you tell me a little bit about, you know, kind of, you know, sort of um, the next sort of like 20 minutes or so about your life and how you got to being a, a vegan activist. And uh, I know we've talked just before we came on air about the word vegan and activism and everything. So can you can you sort of like tell me how you, you got to where you are now? Crikey, where do I start? Um, <laughs> yeah, look, we all live a life and it sort of happens and we, we're all basically here winging it and learning as we go. And I fell into an alternate part of, or an alternate lifestyle for many, many years, one that included um, drug addictions, prison sentences, um, shoplifting. And that took up many, many years, 11 years in total. Um, I was faced with my own mortality in that, I've been shot, I've been stabbed. And by the age of 39, I'd had three heart attacks and I'm 52 now. And then you just sort of, you take stock of, you know, life, or you try to, and you try and ascertain what you want and how you'd like to move forward. And in 2012, I was still eating meat and I moved from Essex to Somerset, where I live now. And I basically had a five acre small holding. And that was where I looked after pigs, sheep, chickens, geese, ducks. Um, coming up to Christmas, I sort of raised and bred turkeys. And yeah, seeing all of that, and it was the sort of, if anyone remembers the sitcom from the 70s, The Good Life, that's what I was trying to emulate at the time. You know, that you've got all these animals running around and it's idyllic to see them as pets. Mm -hmm. But then ultimately, we choose when they live and when they die. Mm -hmm. And I've killed many animals myself and some of the bigger ones, the sheep and the pigs, I've taken to a slaughterhouse, only a small one, but death still happens. Mm -hmm. And um, I've watched what happens. I've... I've seen the fear on them. I've heard the, I've heard the screams and I can't get rid of those. You know, there's many times now when I wake up and, you know, it's like I wake up in a cold sweat and I'm, yeah. I'm in that, I'm in the slaughterhouse and all these animals are being killed around me. Everywhere is just splattered with blood. I wake up feeling as if I'm covered in blood when I'm just profusely sweating. Um, and it's times like that that pull me round. And for me personally, it's memories like that that I don't want to fade because they empower me to carry on doing what I'm doing. Yeah. So anyway, this went on for the best part of two years. And once you've watched the animals die, you come away with an empty trailer. And then you return there a few days later, three, four, five days later, and you literally go in and you carry out big bags like white sacks they were, same sort of size as bin bags of amputated animal parts. Mm -hmm. And each time I took the animals in there, for anyone that's been in a slaughterhouse, the animals go into a holding pen before it's their turn to sort of walk down the... I'm going to call it the chute or the funnel, which is like a narrow walkway, ultimately, that leads to their death, where they're going to have their throat slit. I'd wait with them in the holding pens. And in my, I'm going to say, hypocritical stance there, I believed that I'd done the best for the animals, that they'd had a good life. And then I'd watch them be killed. And I literally have, you know, I didn't just go, oh, bye, 
I would go in and see what was happening because right up until the last moment, I wanted to make sure those animals were cared for, you know, and that used to weigh really, really heavily on my mind. I'd be dejected. Um, I'd feel really, really displaced, fragmented. There were many, many tears. But the stance that I'd been brought up with was that we needed to do this for our survival. And I think, like I said earlier, I'm 52, so I think a lot of people will relate. When I was brought up, your parents went into a meltdown because if you ever said, I don't want to eat the meat, once you found out that it came from a dead animal, parents of sort of my parents' age group, they'd been brought up that you had to have meat and three veg to ensure you were going to be fit and healthy so that you wouldn't get rickets, scurvy, and all of that. So indoctrinations have just been passed down through the generations. So after two years, I was broken. I really was. So I left the small holding and radically or drastically reduced my meat intake. Didn't stop eating meat, but I then started eating more fish and a lot more fruit and mm. more veg. And then because of my massive addiction in 2015, in June 2015, yeah, what's that, six years ago this month, um, I knew I was ill. Like I say, by the age of 39, I'd had three heart attacks. Um, by 2015, I had unstable angina and I was getting several angina attacks a day. So I had to go for an echocardiogram at the local hospital in Taunton at Musgrove Park Hospital. And basically that day changed my whole life. Um, I got ushered in to see a consultant straight after the test. And he turned around and said that my heart was so badly damaged. But um, I didn't have any time left. He didn't say, you've got six months, you've got 12 months. He just went. You shouldn't be here. He said, you should not be waking up each morning. Now, and that was it. And then he went, okay, then we'll send you a letter confirming all this. Bye. So you walk out of there. And my world had absolutely imploded at that point. I went through anger, frustration, sorrow, feeling very, very sad. I'm not going to say I got depressed. Because with me, I have to, I can be impulsive, but then I can also take the time, as we all should, to sort of mull things over and ascertain them. And I'll never forget, it was five weeks to the day of being told that I had no time left until the time when I woke up. And it was just like, I'm one of the lucky ones because they've let me know the problems I'm facing, and now it comes down on me to, to make the changes needed. And I still didn't go vegan. I didn't go vegan until the next year, but I was more aware. And then I went through the stage of sort of, if I did have any meat, it had to be a very, very small piece, and it had to come from a local place. But yeah, I was more mainly on fish then um, and loads of veg and fruit. And then in 2016, I woke up one day and that was it. I literally went vegan overnight, woke up and my dog, you can't see him now, Pagan, he's lying on the sofa there. I got rid of his leather lead, his leather collar. I got rid of all the leather wear I had, belts, wallets, all of that. And, yeah, went vegan. But I didn't actually know. I wasn't doing social media at the time, so I didn't actually know what I was doing. And looking back now, I got quite ill. Um, and hindsight shows me again. I mean, I was eating the, the sort of correct stuff, but hindsight shows me that, my body was having such a massive cleansing process because of all those toxins and poisons and chemicals that go into 
growing the pigs, you know what I mean, and growing the sheep and rear, you know, raising all animals. It was my body just getting rid of that. It was a massive detox. Um, and once that sort of cleared, I started looking into veganism even more. Mm -hmm. I was still having regular updates at the hospital and it worked out I had, what was it? I went back in 2016, that's it. And I'd had nine complaints listed to me in 2015, which was um, unstable angina, ischemic heart disease, solidification of the inner and outer heart walls, atherosclerosis, I had left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular regurgitation. Um, my heart was just absolutely shot to bits. And then, oh, and I also had aortic valve failure. And then when I went back, there was nine altogether. I can't remember all of them. When I went back in 2016, they said that I then had mitral valve failure. Now, mitral valve failure is the serious one because if that fails, you're going to drown in your own blood and you haven't got, you've probably got a few minutes. So I came out of there again in 2016 and just thought, here we go, this is it. But something in me kept going, no, there is a way through this. There is a way you can change this. So as well as writing the some books because I've had five books published now um, as well as writing and taking things easy I was doing my own intense research because I'd heard that there had been people that had reversed heart disease and had gone medication free from having a plant-based diet because plant-based is you know the vegan diet basically you know veganism is the way of life and plant-based is the food that we eat i think that's important to say for a lot of people so i consciously made a shift to go whole food plant-based and i it took a long time because i was cutting out sugars i was cutting out like unnatural oils and everything like that and we got to 2000 and what are we in now 2021 yeah in 2018 i was told that i'd need open heart surgery for whatever reason they told me that i was going to have to have some valves put into me and i said all right what are the valves and they went well calf valves and i flatly refused i thought no i'm not going to have any animal parts put in me and they're like but you'll die and i went well so be it you know, until there's an alternative, I am not going to have. For me personally, I couldn't, I'd have felt hypocritical. So anyway, we moved into 2019. They then said they had some metallic valves and that I was due to have open heart surgery at the start of 2020. I went for an echocardiogram in early 2020 and had some tests and was told before I had the surgery that my heart disease had lessened a lot. A lot of the other symptoms that I had in the ailments were showing signs of reversal and that no open heart surgery was needed at that point. That was like a red rag to a bull. As soon as they said that, for me, it was like, this is working. It really yeah. is. So I then set about coming off my medications. And I was taking some strong medications that I believed and had been told were keeping me alive. Mm -hmm. And I was taking nine medications twice a day. Plus, I had the GTN spray and the um, angina sort of tablets as well, the sublingual tablets. So I think I started last, yeah, I think it was about February or March of last year, I started weaning myself off all the medications. And I believe it was about July or August of last year, I came off the last two. Um, and now while they're still keeping an eye on me, I seem to have sort of confuddled various members of the medical profession because here I am 
someone that was told he didn't have a future mm-hmm. but that that's hard to say mm-hmm. um, and that shouldn't be waking up in the morning I'm now living my best life I'm medication free mm-hmm. I'm more active than I have been in over 25 years I feel much better and from that I knew about nutrition because obviously I've been studying it. And again, at the start of last year, I qualified as a vegan nutritionist. And I've been there, Anna. Yeah. You know, I've, I've raised the animals. I've killed some myself. I've been in the slaughterhouse. I've had the heart conditions. I've been confronted with my own mortality. And I've made those changes and yeah. I started giving public talks on veganism in 2018. Mm-hmm. I think I'd done about six or seven in sort of late 2018. In 2019, I gave 55 talks around the country at 51 different venues. Last year, 2020, um, by mid-February, I was booked for 44. Um, and then we all know what happened last. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I will, at this point in time, I cannot praise highly enough the, the game changers, people, you know, all of these plant-based doctors yeah. that I'm putting the word out there because if it wasn't for them and then me taking on my own research and following mm-hmm. some of their basic sort of recipes that are so readily available mm-hmm. there's a high chance I would not be alive today mm-hmm. and then I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing and mm-hmm. can I, I'm just going to show because um, my fifth book was released mm-hmm. at the um at the end of February this year it's been out three months now and it covers the story I've shared with you Mm -hmm. and I was absolutely honoured a plant-based doctor in the UK Dr Sue Keneally she done the um she done the foreword for it and every vegan's friend the inspirational Philip Wallen Mm -hmm. you know has um done an endorsement for it that's brilliant Brilliant. Living hell to living well. Yeah. 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 Um, and it's so based on that... my story with recipes in there as well. So. Uh-huh. So that's out now then, yeah? And that's available just sort of most bookshops? Yeah, it's been, yeah, you can get it online. You can get it on Amazon. Um, yeah, it's available in every country. Um, not all bookshops will carry the actual book because yeah. there's thousands of them coming out all the time. But every bookshop carries the title. Yeah. Or people can contact me through my website, johnarwin.com, yeah. to request a signed copy. Uh-huh. That's excellent. So, so, so can we can we just go back a few sort of steps? I mean, there was kind of like a, there's an awful lot to unpick there because you've, you've obviously had a very, very um, long sort of, um, you know, sort of um, absolutely jam packed life. Um, so when you were when you're talking about. Um, I was kind of like wondering about the epiphany you had because some people with your kind of like the the lifestyle you were kind of into the drugs and the and the prison and everything yeah. some people just don't end up alive I mean they end up dead yeah. so how yeah. is it that you kind of like changed I mean what, what what was the turning point for you sort of like changing sort of like thinking I am going to stay alive I am going to kind of for me what it was is I'd been a drug addict for 11 years Mm -hmm. and that was to heroin and Mm -hmm. massive amounts of crack cocaine Mm -hmm. and I got to a point I think it was after about eight or nine years Mm -hmm. when I'd half-heartedly tried to sort of come off it and it just Mm -hmm. wasn't happening because it wasn't the right time and after about eight or nine years I got to the point of accepting that that was me that was my life yeah and I think often once we accept situations it's like the universe will sort of come along and go, actually, no, there's mm. there's a bigger plan here. Mm. And it was in 2000 and 2008, I was on my way to go and score 
or collect quite a large amount of heroin. And I got, someone was about to rob me, but they multiply stabbed me instead, well, as well. Um, and I was stabbed three times in the back, collapsed to the floor, bleeding profusely. And I just remember feeling cold, then warm and extremely comfortable. And undoubtedly I was dying then. Yeah. And um, something inside me, and I could literally feel my body coming out of my body as I lay on the floor. And I was just so warm and content. And something then, whether you believe in an almighty deity, monotheism, duality, whatever, something came within me and forced me to hold on. And all I could sense was, hold on, there is more to this life. And that was it. And after a short stay in hospital, um, I had to, I was on methadone anyway at the time of the stabbing. I had to wean myself off of that. Mm -hmm. And then you have to ostracize yourself from situations, you know, places that you go, people that are around you. And that was tough. Um, but I never looked back never looked back and that was this that was like the emergence of who i am now mm -hmm. and it's basically once you get used to that like i say you know once you accept something mm -hmm. that's often at the time when it's like no this is all going to change now mm -hmm. and it did you know and mm -hmm. since then like i say my life has gone on to become mm -hmm. a lot better mm -hmm. I'm certainly more happy with everything. Um, I've got goals, I've got purpose, mm -hmm. and I'm doing what I can to help create the much needed changes in this world. And together, mm -hmm. we're standing on the right side of history. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, one of the things I noticed when you were talking about um, the animals on your small hold, and I mean, you were talking about, you know, you, you talked about killing the animals yourself, and then also taking the larger animals to, to the slaughterhouses. And I got a sense of that you were kind of actually picturing what, what was happening when you were talking to me. Yeah. yeah. So you obviously you're having flashbacks, which is kind of like a bit of PTSD. So how yeah. do you? I know you said it kind of spurs you on, and you don't ever want to lose those pictures. So how do you manage that with your own health and well-being? I can't change the past, mm. um, but and I don't think the past should necessarily be dragged. We're not committed to our past. You know, we shouldn't be dragging it around. Um, and I think it's vital that we learn from it. And then we've got sort of benchmarks. So my own health and well-being is fine. Like I say, um, I also run a small sort of groundworks construction handyman business. That keeps me centred. It certainly keeps me grounded as I'm sort of <laughs> using my little digger. Um, yeah, my health and well-being and perception of life and how fragile not just our lives are, but every life um, is what inspires me every single day. It's what keeps me going, keeps me focused. Um, you yeah. said there about every life being every, every life being precious. I mean, you're, you're right, because I think we kind of when we are doing things like vigils and stuff and you're seeing like vast amounts of, of animals going in and then yeah. you just catch this one animal's eyes and you kind of get the, a sense of that, that one animal is important. So that animal's important and that animal's important, you know, um, we do kind of like we, we sort of like they get lost in, in the numbers, you know, so yeah. it's kind of it is trying to bring it back to that individual, that individual animal. Um, yeah, it really is. You, you mentioned, um, you talked about sort of like giving that, yeah, your, your animals the best life before they went to the slaughterhouse. So obviously that this is kind of like a, like a welfare um, sort of um, side, like mm -hmm. opinion, I suppose, the side of things against the animal yeah. rights side of things. 
So what I said constantly throughout sort of like the stuff I do is that obviously welfare is looking after the animal till it gets killed and animal rights is about not the animal not getting killed full stop. So what's yeah. your kind of like thoughts around that then? I think I totally, totally agree with you there, you know, because we are not fighting until all cages are comfortable. Mm -hmm. We're fighting until all cages, all aquariums mm -hmm. and everything like that until they're all empty. Animal welfare is merely a stepping stone and should never, ever be seen as a precedent. Yeah. It really shouldn't. And how backward are we in coming forward? And I mean, it's only been what I think the last six, eight weeks in 2021 in the UK, the animals have now been granted sentience. You know, people, you know, and it's just like the, the year's 2021. Mm -hmm. You know, we're well, killing 74 billion animals a year around the world mm -hmm. for food that we don't need, that's killing us, that's killing the planet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's raping the oceans, it's raping the lands, and it's just like, I can't believe that we have got to this point and we're still going on about let's not kill the animal. But yet vegans are still, through some aspects of society, seen as the, the oppressive ones. We're seen as the militant ones. We're seen as radical. What, because we don't want any animal to suffer for our sort of, you know, health and everyday life? Yeah. I think what we get is we kind of like you only care about animals you don't care about anything else and we have to say well actually we care about everything it's about it's about yeah. all of us because we all live in harmony and if you have a planet which is dying because you because you you sort of um you know you mass producing animals the planet dies the animals still die and we suffer yeah. as well so it's kind of about all of, of us we, you know? we all benefit if we look after the animals well every other being every other creature animal human you know, every other being is benefiting and working for the whole and the greater good, apart from us. Mm -hmm. We are still set in a very selfish, and I'm going to use the word narcissistic viewpoint yeah. of it's all about me. What is there for me? How am I going to benefit from this? No animal thinks like that. You know, no one else has got the, yeah. the dogmatic views of it is all about us and you know it's just so selfish and unless we start seriously helping for the greater good then there's a high chance that we will be thrown off this planet yeah you mentioned uh, the, the sentience uh, bill which is going through but also this consultation currently at the moment about it which I took uh -huh. part in yesterday. It's um, it's online. At, I think you just basically Google. Um, I think it's Effra or Defra consultation yeah. on animal sentience, and um, it kind of it like goes through sort of like questions and asks you, um, you know, kind of like for your opinion on whether it's gone far enough. And one of the things it's, it asks at the very end is, do you think it goes far enough because it includes it only includes vertebrate animals? So you're yeah. kind of thinking like all the you know the sea creatures and all the other animals which which don't have spines. Um, so they're not including those, I know. But you, um, so obviously there's been a big sort of uh, push at the moment on uh, on sea spiracy and fish. Yeah. And we um, we aired an interview with uh, Captain Paul Watson last week, you know. Um, so we were saying that you know we've been trying to push the fact that fish have the same sentience as as other animals as well. So why do we feel as if like fish are sort of second rate citizens in the animal world? Yeah. So what do you think? Um. The sad thing is, like I said earlier, you know, when I massively reduced my mm. meat intake, yeah. I then replaced it with mm. fish. Yeah. You know, but then when you think about it, meat is flesh. Mm -hmm. And fish have got flesh, you know what I mean? Mm. So basically, they shouldn't be in a category of their own. Mm. It should be all as one. You know, any being that has got A central nervous system feels pain. They feel emotions. I mean, you can go onto Google and check it out. You know, there's little 
tiny, teeny tiny little lobsters that are trying to escape from like, you know, pots of boiling water that are going to kill them. You know, cause fish feel pain. And if anyone thinks anything else, then they really need to try and sort of catch up with it all. Because there's another, I mean, sea spiracy is incredible. And, you know, Captain Paul Watson, you know, who sort of helped found, uh, found Sea Shepherd, you know, the work he does and all of the crews that go out there, they put themselves in harm's way time and time again. And I tip my hat to all of them. So Sea Spiracy, which is available on Netflix, there's also another one come out now called The Dark Hobby. Mm -hmm. And that goes on about fish that are basically living in small bowls, in, you know, small tanks and things mm -hmm. like that. And basically, we've got to realise that, like you said earlier, Anna, we are all, this is a collective. Mm -hmm. We are all here together and we should we are the only species that aren't doing the best we can. We're not working for the common good of everybody involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are just selfish mm -hmm. and we're seeing every other life as a commodity. Yeah. And that has to end. People's thought patterns have to change, you know, from when you go in shops and supermarkets and you see people literally just blindly going through the motions they are they're carrying their basket or their trolley and they're just chucking stuff into it yeah. and i have before i've said why are you putting that in there and they're like well i actually don't really know it's something <laughs> that i've always done mm -hmm. you know and you think well it's time that was stopped then yeah. it really is you know and we need legislations brought in from the top the governments need to realise that eating meat is killing animals. It's also damaging the environment. You know, it's causing deforestation, water acidification, air quality. Um, dare I say it, Ebola, MERS, yeah. SARS, yeah. HIV, yeah. avian flu, and also COVID-19 <laughs> is a direct result of how we treat you know, and consume animals. Yeah. And anyone can yeah. check all of that out. You know, it yeah. doesn't take a genius to go in there yeah. and it's got how it's all come about, how it's manifested, how it's been passed on from the animals to mm. a vertebrate creature like we are. Yeah. You know, we have to yeah. stop. Well, I say that when I, you know when I do sort of like the virtual outreaches to accompany the um, the, the physical outreaches we do, I always say, "Don't take my word for it. Check the facts. Just go out and you can go and research. There's loads of stuff out there. You know, yeah. you can go on to Viva, or you can go on to something totally different. You don't have to go out to an animal organisation. And they're all peer assessed, peer reviewed studies. And also, if you say something which is, um, you know, something which is in favour of killing animals this way, killing or doing something different." look at who is funding the research yeah, because you'll exactly invariably right. find it's the dairy industry or the meat industry or the pork industry yeah. you know and it comes down to this is the same sort of battle as people that were against smoking had yeah. mm -hmm. now how many on your on your journey walking through the streets or whatever you do in a day how many people do you actually see that smoke yeah. hardly any yeah. and it's because the government sorted out the revenue from the vape fluids, from the sort of, you know, nicotine chewing gum and all stuff like that. And I totally believe that once the government have sorted out the revenue in the plant-based idea, and they should be funding those anyway, because not only will it save the planet and sort of help millions and billions of animals, yeah. it will also help people. Yeah. You know, and I'm living proof of that, Anna. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've reversed my own heart disease. I've come off medication. You imagine the average or most people, there's a high percentage of people that take some sort of pharmaceutical drug. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I'm not saying veganism is going to solve all of the world's problems, mm -hmm. but my God, it's the best place that we can possibly start from. It mm -hmm. really is. Mm -hmm. and. We do, we 
we take penalties because they've got atherosclerosis and the fats that they've consumed all of their life, which is animal fats, mm -hmm. have clogged them up. Mm -hmm. So they'll take them in and give them another chance. And then when it comes to dinner time, they'll start feeding them meats again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just, yeah. hang on a minute, even a child could work this out. Yeah. It's got yeah. to change. It's imperative and it really has to. Yeah, I've got members of my family and, and friends who are on lots and lots of medication and they, yeah. you know, they'll sort of say, I'm taking this to make me better for this, I'm taking that to make me better for this. And then you think, yeah, but you're actually you're eating meat, you're eating fish and you're wondering why you have to take these things. It's just, like you said, a you child I mean, could work it out. It's well, it's like um, one of the greatest universities in the world or prolific you know is harvard or harvard however you want to say it in america now people have always listened to their findings you know one of the findings they put out a few years ago that the optimum amount of meat needed for a, for humans to be healthy was precisely zero now, how come people aren't picking it up and running with it? I know we are seeing small changes and they're in integrating constantly. It's like in 2019, I've done a post the other day on Facebook because sometimes it, it can be quite depleting as a vegan and people can sort of start losing the will because people don't seem to be listening to us. Yeah. But in 2019 alone in the UK, 50% of all new foods and drinks released were labelled as vegan. Yeah. Now you might think, oh, well, that's all right then. That's massive. Even if there was only two things released that year, one yeah. of them was vegan. There was a lot, lot more than that. But that just shows we are making inroads. Yeah. But now legislations from the top need to come down. They really do. And, yeah. you know, stringency needs to be put in place. Yeah. People like you that are prepared to interview people that have turned their life around mm -hmm. and they know of a different viewpoint, you should be being funded for what you're doing because you're helping to change the game. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting in terms of, um, you know, you're talking about what what will it take for people to sort of start listening to us. I think it's a, it's a two part sort of a problem really. P partly it's down to conditioning because people are so afraid of what they've always done they don't want to change and that they're frightened of change and you know most people are frightened of change there's others who embrace change um and they will be open-minded you know we've got people in our group um kevin for example who watched game changers you watched game yeah. changers to kind of try and um sort of um you wanted to discredit all of the information in it found out that you couldn't and then he went vegan, <laughs> you know, um, which is, and he's actually a fantastic activist. He's absolutely brilliant. Um, and then we've got um, the other part of it is the legislation, because somewhere along the line, there's an awful lot of money going into farming. There's subsidies for starters. If they get rid of the subsidies, I know it's kind of don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, get rid exactly of the subsidies, that. you know, start subsidising transitional farming. I said exactly this to my partner yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is, you know, stop propping up an industry that's failing. Yeah. You know, even for people that want to research it, mm. um, she has been awarded several times the top dairy herds woman in the UK. And also she's got something to do with Europe as well. Dr. Jude Kappa, her name is. Now, she's an intelligent lady and she's actually, you know, what I mean, she I believe she's still got a massive dairy farm she wrote in length a few years ago she gave dairy 12 years tops if this is coming from the inside and they're admitting it's a failing industry why don't the government just bail out and go right that's it and let's put your subsidies into new plant-based innovation foods yeah we have uh, i mean I've, I've done some interviews with them um, with, with jay wild um who also works with reformed and and so right, yeah. and um rebecca knowles from farmers for stock free farm and they are you know they're putting their money where their mouth is rather than the government funding them because yeah. they're doing just that given sort of like you know um you know really good ways of getting out of, mm -hmm. uh, of animal farming um yeah. diversifying you know sort of uh, like glamping holiday sort of diversification yeah. all sorts of things you know and you just think we just need the government to sit up and kind of say that this is what we are going to do now 
I know in the um, there's a climate summit in November in Glasgow, yeah. and I, I'm you know I know this is a conservative government, and you kind of like you should, should, should you know I don't want to sort of get into politics, but you kind of think. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a bit sort of like it's a bit bizarre that, that they have to sort of like you know kind of like agreeing that we need to eat less meat and dairy. Um, so I'll be interested. I'll, I'll be interested to watch what what's happening with that. Yeah. You know. You know, and that's another thing. You know, I think it was it was sixty odd percent, but now it's like seventy percent of all arable land throughout the world is designated to grow crops yeah. for the animals. And what is it? I believe it's. A kilo of beef yeah. takes 7,000 litres of water to produce. Mm -hmm. Now, that 7,000 litres mm -hmm. would be enough water for seven years mm -hmm. for one person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's no matter what aspect we come in from this, Anna, mm -hmm. you look at it and you're just like, this is not rocket science. <laughs> we can conserve you know, water, we can clean up the planet, we can make the air better, we can make sure that we never get any more, um, you know, viruses like MERS and SARS and COVID-19 if we just change the way we're doing things. Because if something isn't broke, then you don't need to fix it. Yeah. My God, the world is lying in tatters and people are still continuing in ways that have served them no good. They're serving the animals no good and they're doing no good at all. We are a blight and we are the cancer and the virus upon this planet at this you know, moment in time. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, want my legacy to be that I tried my hardest to make people see an alternative because I wanted to create change. And I'm proud to be giving a talk with you today or an interview. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to know so many vegan activists because together we are standing on the right side of history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We might not see it in our lifetime a vegan world, but my God, we're laying a foundation for it there. Mm -hmm. And we're backing on from what Donald Watson and his, yeah. his band of brothers and sisters started forming back in 1944 yeah. and also people like pythagoras yeah you know 500 years ad he was around and he was going well you don't need to be doing this yeah. because if you have to kill animals you're going to carry that on into your life you're going to kill people where does it stop yeah. this is not a fad it's not a trend this is yeah. reality and we want to make it a better reality for all concerned yeah. And one of the things you said there, it has been a lot around a lot longer than people realise. It's been yeah. around through history. When I was talking to um, I talked to Jordi Casamajana a few um, few weeks ago, and um, I, I was reading his book, and his, his book is kind of like going into the history of veganism. It's been around since the, the year dot. It's just mm. kind of obviously the social media, and it's it's much more kind of like a, a marketing thing, you know. Um, but we are on the right side of history, and and I'm an extremely positive person. I feel as if in my lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, we have to be. Yeah, exactly. In, in my lifetime, I think we'll see the fall of dairy. Um, yeah, undoubtedly. I've always said that. Yeah. 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 And I think we'll also see a massive pu a push towards uh, towards plant based, if nothing else, you know. Um, yeah. And also we'll probably we will probably get there in terms of vivisection as well. We probably will mm -hmm. in my lifetime get there in terms of getting rid of animal testing because there's yeah. no logic to any of it, you know. Um, None of it. None of it at all. Yeah. You know, and they know, once again, that's being sort of stoppered up by the government. Mm -hmm. And they know, you know, the tests have proved that, what is it, around 92% of tests yeah. that pass in animals fail in when they're passed over to humans. Well, like, that's not rocket science. You know, we've, we've got a different helix, a different DNA. Of course it's going to be different. Yeah. We're not being this way because we have to be because we know better yeah. we're doing that way because we're just stuck in a rut mm -hmm. and for a so-called free thinking evolved species bit of an epic fail there isn't it mm -hmm. <laughs> it, is. it is so so what's next for you then what's next for me i'm hoping to get out there this year and do some talks mm -hmm. um, about veganism and health and yeah just trying to make a difference each day because mm. after what i've been through i absolutely love waking up each yeah. morning and you know as soon as i wake up in the morning i'm opening up the two biggest presents 
that you can have. And that's my eyes. I can see the world. And from there, I just take time to think, you know what? I've got another shot at this. I've got another day to try and make a difference, to make someone happy, to help where I can, and to be the best version of myself that I can be. And that, for me, is like my mantra. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a... a that's a, that's a brilliant way to end on. <laughs> so uh, so thank you very much. It's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. You've had an extremely jam-packed life. And, you know, and it's, it's brilliant to, to, to talk to someone who's who's kind of like gone through, you've kind of been there and done it and actually come out the other end. And now you're kind of like you're advocating for animals uh, so, so vocally. You know, it's absolutely brilliant. So thank you very well, much for, for, that, for talking no, to us. I, I really appreciate that, Anna. And um, I'm going to throw it back at you now because... The Northeast Animal Rights Facebook page, you know, you do a fantastic job on there, you know, and a lot of what you do, you're not taking credit for because we don't, you know, we just do it. But you're very prolific on there. You show some brilliant alternatives. We were speaking about that before we started this, you know, so, yeah, people need to sort of realise what you do. And we're all in this together. And I think age helps as well yeah. that we start recognizing mm -hmm. what weapons that we've got in our own personal armory yeah. and then we have to sort of use them and play to our strengths and that's where the collective passion and dedication comes from and i am i'm just proud to be connected with so many wonderful people mm -hmm. and to be a part of it all mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, no, thank you very much for all you do. <laughs> thank you very much. I have, I have to say, it's not just me. I've got, I've got a fantastic team. I know I lead them, but they, but I have got a fantastic team of people that are absolutely brilliant. And I learned so much yeah. from them as well. You know, it's just great. <laughs> and we should never, ever stop learning, though, should we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to say thank you very much. We're going to sign off now. So, uh, thank, so thank you, you very much, uh, John. This is Anna Melia from Northeast Animal Rights. Um, saying thank you and and, uh, and best of luck from um, from everyone at NIA with everything you do in the future and I hope your talks go well. Um, so bye bye for now and take care. <laughs>